I think in California there's three things everybody in California uh, is worried about from an environmental perspective. Uh, the first one's water. Uh, everybody's afraid we're going to run out or we're not going to have it where we need it or it's going to be dirty or polluted or whatever. The second one is fire. Uh, basically every part of California burns <laughs> and will continue to burn and, and um, at times we don't like the way it burns. And then the third one is cannabis. Uh, that's the third thing everybody in California is interested in, uh, at times worried about. There's three different types of grows and we really only study one of them very well. Uh, the first one is indoor growing. So this is people who have warehouses or the basement of a house that they bought or uh, anything else inside. These are oftentimes, uh, well, these are all, use, they all use artificial light, I guess is the main characteristic. So these actually do have some interesting environmental impacts insofar as they have a really big carbon footprint because they use tremendous amounts of energy. Um, it's hard to know how much cannabis is grown in this way because um, you can't see it. Um, we do know that on the, the legal market, um, especially, I, I don't know about the recreational market yet, but in the medical market, uh, over half the stuff you would usually find in stores is grown indoors. Um, and this is because they have a little bit higher quality control because they're setting the lights to a certain time. They can really control every aspect of the, the flower production. The second type of grow is the uh, trespass grows. So these are basically grows where people are growing illegal either on somebody else's property or oftentimes on public lands. So these are sort of the grows you oftentimes see in the newspaper where um, somebody's gone into a national park or a national forest and they've cleared some land and they've planted a thousand plants and they have irrigation and they have uh, rat poison and there's two guys who live out there all summer and then they harvest it at the end of the year and leave. And these are, you know, just horrible and um, they're pervasive uh, on public lands and you do see them some on private lands. What we look at is what we call agricultural grows. So these are people who grow uh, cannabis like you would grow, say, tomatoes or uh, another agricultural plant. Um, the systems vary widely in how they work. I would say at this point, probably two thirds of the farms have some sort of uh, greenhouse structure. So oftentimes plants are uh, started at a greenhouse and then put outside at some point during the year. Other production systems have them being in the greenhouse the whole time, and they'll do multiple crops in one season. And then other systems are completely outdoor. So they're planting outdoor, very small plants, and growing them uh, outdoor from the very start. Um, the main advantage of growing in this way is that you don't pay for the electricity, so you have the sunlight. And, um, and so that reduces the cost to the grower by quite a bit versus the indoor growing. earliest documented plants were in the early 60s uh, in Humboldt County. There was a back to the land movement that took place in the 60s and early 70s. Um, these were counterculture folks who were moving away from um, San Francisco or other cities and wanted to have sort of a back to the land experience. Um, they moved to Humboldt County primarily because it was cheap. So they would buy cut over timberland, so areas that, that all the redwoods had been harvested and they sort of took it upon themselves to rehabilitate the land, to try to grow their own food. And part of that uh, culture also involved uh, growing cannabis. Uh, you know, at first for their own use and then becoming uh, an underground economy. Uh, this underground economy grew very quickly during the 80s and 90s. Um, and even by the, the early 90s, people acknowledged it as a huge part of the local economy. Um, Around this time, the federal government started doing, a pro I guess it was in the 80s, the federal government started a program called CAMP, which was a marijuana eradication program in Humboldt County. And so this was every fall, they'd show up with SWAT teams and helicopters and fly all over the hills and come and raid people's property and cut down their plants. Um, it wasn't actually very effective, but it did land a lot of people in jail for, for a long time. Uh, but the cannabis culture continued to develop. Uh, 1996, California was the first state in the country to uh, pass a medical cannabis uh, law. Um, this law basically said if you were a licensed caregiver, you could grow cannabis for, for somebody else. Um, the original law said uh, up to six plants per patient. So if you were a cannabis grower, if you, you could get uh, 10 buddies together and get their cannabis cards, you could grow 60 plants legally in California. Um, 
There's a state Supreme Court ruling in 2006, which basically uh, said there was no limit, that the limits placed on that were unconstitutional. And so <laughs> at that point, people started growing up to 99 plants. Uh, above 99, it was a federal um, criminal act and it uh, had a five-year mandatory minimal sentence. So people were growing for the medical markets. The problem was, and the problem still is, there's no chain of custody. So you could have, uh, you could be approved to grow medical marijuana, but nobody ever traced where your marijuana actually went. And so the vast majority of the people growing medical marijuana were, were selling it in the black market. And that's the case today. Most people who are growing legal marijuana or um, growing it as if it's legal are, are selling it out of state. We think that Humboldt County probably produces three to six times as much cannabis as the state of California uses in a year. What I did was um, I set up a systematic sampling strategy and I worked with over 30 undergraduate researchers along with colleagues from the Nature Conservancy and my colleague Jake Brenner at Ithaca College. And we spent um, the better part of two years just mapping as many cannabis farms as we could see in a systematic way. And that gave us a data set where we could say um, a lot of things about these farms. So how big they are, how many plants they typically have, where they're located in the environment. So as of 2012, we had identified um, in about half of Humboldt County, we had identified about um, a million cannabis plants, give or take. Um, we've redone that, that research and have newer maps, and uh, there's a lot more now. <laughs> um, so the, the trend is just in, increasing production at all times. Um, the farms are typically small, um, especially in 2012, I think the average farm had about 90 plants. Um, it was less than an acre in size, so pretty small. Um, most of the farms are located sort of far from roads, so they're off in the middle of the woods or the middle of the, the oaks. They are oftentimes near um, habitat that could be good for endangered species. So we looked at the location of the groves relative to fish habitat for uh, steelhead, chinook, and coho salmon. And, um, you know, preponderance of the groves are within um, a half a kilometer of habitat for these species. Um, so with their water use, we think there probably is an impact on, on those uh, sort of important and charismatic species. So the biggest impacts from the groves that I study, which are sort of the agricultural groves, so not the groves that people are hiding back in the woods, um, it probably comes from a combination of uh, three things. So uh, only one of those we've been able to study very well. So the first thing is people just clear the land for the farms. So um, although the farms are typically small, an acre or so, um, about two-thirds of the farms we've looked at have actually cleared forests to, to make the farm. Um, so the forest clearing is a big issue. Uh, the second thing which we haven't done, we haven't been able to study quite as well, is um, most of these farms are far from roads, and so there's road building that goes on. Um, in Humboldt County, you need a permit to build a road, but whether people are actually getting these permits or not, I don't know, probably not. Um, if they are getting the permits, are they building the roads up to code? Um, we don't know, but we think there's probably major impacts from the road building that goes on. And then the third one is uh, water use. So uh, cannabis is not necessarily a thirsty plant relative to any other agricultural plant, but it doesn't rain in Humboldt County for six months of the year. And so you're going to have about 150 days where you need to irrigate your crop. Um, nobody knows how much water people are using for cannabis. Estimates vary widely, but um, people do take water directly from streams uh, to, to irrigate their crop. And a lot of these streams are small headwater streams uh, where there's not a lot of extra water. And especially in the fall of the year before the rains start, which is when they're irrigating heavily, um, we may see uh, damage to aquatic ecosystems. Humboldt County is extremely hilly and um, there's hardly a flat spot to find and the cannabis farmers have typically just grown on hillsides. So oftentimes you'll see terracine or you'll see someone take a bulldozer and just flatten off a hilltop and put their farm on that. So people are growing in areas that are definitely prone to erosion which is one thing we're very concerned about. Another thing that's really interesting is that these farms all import their soil. So they don't use the soil that's there, and so they bring in truckload of, after truckload of, of, of soil, which 
is potentially interesting from an ecosystem perspective because it's ending up somewhere in the ecosystem. Either it's staying there or it's eroding into streams. Uh, we don't know the fate of it, but uh, the farmers are not enhancing the natural soil that's there. They're importing soil to grow on, typically. I mean, it's interesting. We, we published some numbers that we had found from a, a grower's guide in Humboldt County, and it was saying six or eight gallons a day per plant for 150 days, uh, which if you talk to growers now, they'll say, no, no, we don't use that much. So how much they really use, we don't know. But one thing that's interesting is that the cumulative amount of water used by cannabis in Humboldt County is not that much. So even if we use that estimate, which most growers think is too high, um, and we look at all of the farms that we think are, are out there, we doubled the estimate of how many we found because we mapped about half the county, and we add a little bit, it ends up being about 10,000 acre feet of water. Well, so there's a river that runs through Humboldt County called the Eel River, which is a famous sort of beautiful river. It's a fish for salmon and steelhead. It's been degraded by all the, the, the timber, but it's, it's coming back. And in the summer, it goes sort of dry. And so there's been a concern of, oh my goodness, like this cannabis, these cannabis users are taking out the water and the eel's gonna go dry and everything else. Uh, there's a dam on the Eel River, which diverts water to grape growers in Sonoma County. That dam diverts about 150,000 acre feet of water a year. So 15 times more water than all the cannabis users in Humboldt County is being diverted from that area by grape growers to the south. So, you know, the scale of the impacts is sort of interesting to think about it. At the same time, it's really important to note that although the cumulative, the cumulative amount of water isn't that much, they take it from places and at times of the year that might be extremely sensitive. So even taking a small amount of water from a headwater stream in August after it hasn't rained for four or five months could be really damaging. So it's an interesting dynamic um, where it's not sort of the total amount, it's more the timing and the placement of the use that could be important. I'm Dr. Greta Wenger, co-director of Integral Ecology Research Center. And our organization has worked for the past five or six years looking at the environmental impacts of trespass cultivation on public lands. Primarily Forest Service lands, but they also fall on Bureau of Land Management, national and state park lands occasionally, and even on private timber lands and even private ranch lands. I'm Daniel Jeffcoach. I wrote a report about illegal marijuana cultivation in national parks, uh, Whiskey Town National Recreation Area and Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park. The grows usually took place around three to 5,000 feet elevation. Various forms of chaparral, oak woodland, some mixed hardwood forests, and it was always in or near um, riparian zones. They choose areas that have two stories of vegetation so they can clear out the understory and then still have the overstory for concealment. And what they'll do is they'll terrace areas or they'll make individual plant wells for each plant and then often divert water from nearby streams or springs into those areas. So it usually includes some clearing of vegetation, uh, some leveling or terracing, and then also water management and moving it around. They're very prevalent, probably significantly more prevalent than in any other region of the United States, although it does occur elsewhere. Um, so let's say we estimate that law enforcement detects maybe 50% of what's actually out there, and that might be a, a liberal estimate of how many they're actually detecting. The market is throughout the United States, and so um, California being the largest producer, then inherently it must be going to the East Coast or Midwest or, or the South. So likely that's where all the black market marijuana is headed. My name is Cody Wheeler and I'm the law enforcement patrol captain for the U.S. Forest Service on the Sierra National Forest in California. The majority of the marijuana for sale is being sent back east. The, what used to be the BC bud, what everybody wanted back east is now the California bud, the, specifically the Northern California bud. But by the time it gets back east, I don't know how they know what exactly they are smoking or what they aren't or where it came from. A lot of our challenges is uh, staffing for the Sierra National Forest, which covers the from the Kings River all the way to the Merced River. We have three officers right now and two investigators. So for that span, there's, there's so many roads and so many access points. Fully staffed, I'd have five. But if I had double or triple that, we could actually prevent some of this. We could actually work the roads, do our normal resource protection jobs, and stop this before it even occurs. Oh, no. 
As far as we know, I think the main impacts are probably water theft and pesticide use. And the growers typically use all in a large assortment of pesticides at these sites, um, ranging from insects, insecticides, rodenticides, and lots of high nitrogen, high phosphorus, and PK fertilizers, which eventually wash into the watersheds typically. Uh, whereas the pesticides uh, do all kinds of damage to the fauna, so wildlife, um, aquatic species, and uh, potentially risk to humans as well. And then of course the, the water diversions and water theft amounts to uh, probably over a billion gallons per year to California. In the past 10 years we've had over 3,700 trespass grows just on Forest Service property, just in California. And with that um, there was over 17 million plants eradicated. And so if you do the math on about 900 gallons for a mature plant. That's over like 19 billion gallons of water in the past 10 years that's been diverted towards trespass grows. So riparian areas are regions near water, whether it's springs or ponds, and they're areas where there's a lot of hydrophilic plants and animals, things that require water. So these grow sites grow in riparian regions and they divert that water and that's been shown to have a large enough effect to damage salmon runs in Northern California, all the way down to damaging spawning amphibians in the Southern Sierra. So affecting those riparian regions near water can affect many organisms. So we have detected rodenticides in the soil. I think the, the longest the resi re residues have stayed that we've detected is over a year. Um, we, to date, have not detected rodenticide in the water. However, we have detected the other pesticides in the, the streams down, downstream of the groves. So we've detected carbofurin, diazinon, and a couple other insecticides. And so it is, we, we know for a fact, it's getting into the watersheds. And it is staying in the soil um, up to, you know, some of the other pesticides will stay in the soil up to a year and a half to two years. There's a wide variety of chemicals they use in pesticides. The main three classes are organophosphates and carbamates, and those are insecticides used. It's essentially a neurotoxin, but they target insects. There's anticoagulant rodenticides, which target small mammals, and then there's also pyrethroids, which is another insecticide that targets the nervous system. So animals are exposed to organophosphates and carbamates directly if they're insects or directly if they're birds and they're eating the granular formation. They can also get contaminated by eating leaves that have been treated or eating insects that have been treated or simply through inhalation or absorption through the skin. Um, they've actually been shown to cause permanent damage to western pond turtles that live in the southern Sierra where the organophosphates have caused irre irreversible damage to their nervous system. So a variety of organisms from insects that directly consume it to any organisms that may be eating those insects. So anticoagulant rodenticides are put out in the form of baits so that any small mammals that would chew on the irrigation lines um, will be attracted to those and eat them. And what they do is they inhibit a vitamin that helps with blood clotting. So they'll die through internal bleeding. We know for a fact that these rodenticides and other pesticides cause the death of fishers, spotted owls, and probably countless other animals. Um, black bears, we've seen dead ringtails, dead gray foxes, deer, um, and pretty much anything that uses the forest, all kinds yeah. of dead rodents. There is also the idea that you know, if these animals don't die from pesticides, they are compromised such that they're not producing as many offspring, they're more subject to potentially predation by other creatures, and may even pose a risk to humans that, that consume these, you know, deer, bear, uh, etc. Fertilizers can have a wide variety of impacts on an ecosystem. One of the main problems is that they tend to decrease biodiversity. So the reason that could happen in the Southern Sierra is because many of these areas where marijuana grows happen naturally have low soil nutrient levels. And so the plants there are adapted for low soil nutrients. So when you add fertilizers, it makes the environment more conducive to invasive species and weeds and other pests. So raising the nutrient level in the soil might seem like a good thing because it usually raises biomass levels, 
but it favors invasive species so it can harm the areas where it's applied. I'm Catherine Purcell and I'm a research wildlife biologist with the Forest Service and I study fishers and other wildlife species. The fisher is a member of the weasel family that's found only in North America. They're found across most of Canada and south into most of the major mountain ranges. They're forest carnivores, but their diet is actually quite diverse, especially in the southern Sierra Nevada. In most parts of their range, um, snowshoe hares and porcupines are major parts of their diet, and neither of those are found here. So our fishers eat squirrels, rodents, um, they always have some vegetable material in their diet. They'll eat insects, lizards. So we never set out to study um, toxicants and the effect on fishers. It was something that just came up from the work we were doing. It was completely accidental. So our goals were to study fishers, to learn more about their survival, their reproduction, and importantly, um, how they respond to forest management activities. The first fissure that was found that, um, was, that died directly from rodenticide poisoning looked like it was just asleep on the ground. It had no indication of predation. It looked like a completely healthy fissure. We send our dead fissures to UC Davis for a necropsy, and when they opened up the fissure, the body cavity was filled with blood. So these are anticoagulant rodenticides. So the primary cause of mortality in fishers is predation. I think that's 74% of all of the dead fishers that we found, followed by disease and um, toxicants related to marijuana grows. We found um, seven fishers that have died f directly from um, rodenticide poisoning. But more importantly, of all the fishers that we've tested, the exposure rate is 88%, and the exposure rate appears to be increasing. So the fissures occur at a range of about three to 7,000 feet in elevation. Many of these are low elevation sites where the um, marijuana gardens are, so there's huge amount of overlap in the fissure habitat and where these sites are found. So primary poisoning occurs when an animal ingests the toxicant directly. And fissures can ingest these toxicants because um, many times they use flavorizers that make them more attractive to fishers. Alternatively, fishers can eat prey that have been exposed to these rodenticides, and then they accumulate these toxins in their system. So we test for eight different anticoagulant rodenticides, and we found up to five of them in one particular fissure. So we not only have direct effects of the <clears throat> rodenticides on fishers, we also have potentially sublethal effects. For every additional toxicant that we found in carcasses, the um, chance of dying from predation increases two and a half to three times. We've also documented that mortality is highest in the spring. This is when all of the grow activities are occurring. This is also when the female fishers are denning. They're finding prey for their young, so they're hunting at a higher rate. This is also when mating occurs, so the males are traveling long distances to find fishers, female fishers to mate with, so they're exposed to a lot more of these gardens also. So we have documented transfer of um, rodenticides to kits from um, nursing females. So a large number of species have been found, dead carcasses have been found at grow sites, including deer, coyotes, gray foxes, a number of bird species, quail, ravens, jays, vultures, both spotted owls and barred owls. Um, bears have been found buried at grow sites. Only about 20 to 40 percent of these sites are found each year, and probably about 10 percent of them are remediated. So all of the sites get their plants removed, but the toxins and the trash remain on the ground. so that it's sequestered and that it's out of everybody's harm's way so then people walk in and pull in this line and all that can then safely remove the infrastructure because the hazardous material has been mitigated away
So my name is Dr. Murad Gabriel. I am uh, co-director of Integral Ecology Research Center up in Blue Lake, California. So you can hear that rushing water in the background. So right. that's actually, there's a creek, there's two creeks that come in here. Uh, just to give you the lay of the land, these two creeks come in and they go into the San Joaquin River that goes uh, down to the San Joaquin Valley that feeds a lot of uh, either agriculture and also salmonid, so salmon and anadromous fish bearing streams. But there's also a lot of grows around here that also flow into a local lake where people recreate. Now what happens, what the cultivators do, they put irrigation pipe, um, and you can clearly see some of this irrigation pipe, that's one inch tubing, and they'll go ahead and tap it into that creek build up the velocity by gravitational feeds. And so it'll just come in, build up velocity, swing it up from the creek, and then it pulses into this grow and then charges all of these lines. The spaghetti tubing that comes in and they cap in, and each one will have an emitter. The emitters would be a quarter to upwards of a half a gallon per hour. So if there's thousands of gallons of, uh, of thousands of plants, half a gallon per hour, uh, you know, we're talking 24 hours a day and it's not for the growing season. These cultivators don't pull out the pipe at the end of the day. They keep them in there year round. So that's 365 days a year, 24 hours of half a gallon per hour. Millions of gallons a site could easily be poaching from our public lands. That's only one site. This fertilizer, this is highly concentrated soluble fertilizer. So 15, 15, 15 is the ratio. But, you know, what has been discussed is that a bag of this could be acres of a natural agricultural product. Um, so the, you, we're talking about one 50 pound bag, another 50 pound bag, two, you know, I think at this complex itself at close to 2000, so about a ton of soluble fertilizer that was distributed or, or, or open that now, as you can see, the next rain event is going to flush this right into the water sources that leads to communities, to recreational areas, to where people are trying to utilize their public lands. This was a full bottle of carbofuran at one point, and you could clearly see additional puncture wounds in there. Bear in mind that this, this material right here, it, it takes about a quarter of a teaspoon to kill a 600 pound male African lion. So an eighth of a teaspoon can kill easily a 300 pound uh, North American black bear. Now we have a liter of this material right here, but this also is compromised by bear, which means that some bear bit into that and possibly is dead somewhere out in the forest. Naturally is reinforced plastic hosing, which is translucent with white um, uh, strands of fiber to reinforce that pipe. It's not naturally supposed to be pink. Now the other crazy thing about it is because it is pink and discolored already, that means that they didn't use a diluted form of carbofuran. They put it in a highly concentrated fashion. That the marijuana product, and we're not talking about like the leaf or the stem, we're talking about the flowering product that's pro the, the product that's supposed to be market marketed. That product is contaminated with carbofuran, and that's not just one. We've actually had product that has had two to upwards of three different types of pesticide present on just that product itself. So this says Fosfora de Zinc, and you can see it says Peligro, which means danger, and it says also uh, uh, in, in Echo in Mexico. So this is, this is something that was made, um, and then it's not for distribution at all in the United States. And you can clearly see that puncture wound right there that is from either uh, some large type of carnivore that has punctured this and has compromised this and either consumed it or popped into their mouth. But this also, the other key thing, is is 80%. Zinc phosphide that's usually distributed in the United States is at one to 2%. So you can see this is a highly concentrated, or was until the animal compromised it, a highly concentrated container of zinc phosphide. And unfortunately, like the carbofuran, we find this almost at every grow. There, there, a lot of these grows are riddled with this type of material uh, that it wasn't for distribution here in the United States. Great fox in there, another gray fox. Oh, that's been coming in. Oh, there's a black bear with a split ear. So there's that, and that was yesterday, wow. or two days ago. Another bear, different bear. That's another bear. <laughs> that's another black bear. If you look, that blair's got some white stuff on it. Oh, that probably some type of mite infestation, maybe. That split ear blair. 
and then gray fox again. Oh, there's a chippy or yeah, yeah. chippy. And then another one there, another different type of bear. Another gray fox. And I think the one thing is kind of a, we got a good photo. Let me, another bear, another bear. Again, that's, what this is kind of just demonstrating is, I know there's one, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling through oh, these really okay. fast. It's a really good photo. There it is. So if you look, that bear has got white muck some type of muck all over it and it's just coming into the camp which is where those carbofurin bottles were and look at its head is covered in that material same terrible and then another bear big bear and so then, all these bears are probably dead possibly yeah that's definitely a possibility a oh, duck squirrel and a gray squirrel so you have squirrels there's a lot of rodenticide that was used here too that's a beautiful bear but, but that's what we're doing that's part of our component of our, this project is that we put these cameras out before and after and then we have our we have also a um, this is our treatment we have a control site too off-site which we're trying to see like is a control um, going to demonstrate a stagnant layer of wildlife vegetation over here we're going to have a higher diversity higher abundance but once the reclamation occurs uh, our hypothesis is that whether or not it's going to go back to the same levels as control so that means then this is facilitating habitualizing wildlife but at the same point allowing um, them to not just interact with the food but also interaction with the pesticides so the Southern Sierra is a hotspot for biodiversity. And why that's important is because everything is interconnected from megafauna, like bighorn sheep, all the way down through pollinators, like bees. So we need to do a lot more than just eradicate the plants. We need to get in there and we need to clean up these sites and we need to get these toxins out of there. So now that we know there are health risks in doing any kind of reclamation or cleaning up these sites, we have to wait a certain amount of time before we can go back in and we think safely deal with all this material. And so there is that, that risk, continued risk to the environment that happens as we're waiting to for re-entry. Re um, you know, the, we know that soil can be contaminated, so that is sort of a risk if you go in right after the grow. Um, soil gets lifted, the plants, are contaminated and so you just sort of have to be you know cautious about that so some sites can be you know 15 to 40 50 thousand dollars when you put in helicopter the amount of labor and personnel to clean up a major complex and that's just again clean up the infrastructure that's not restoration of the land and that's also using NGOs and nonprofits like High Sierra Volunteer Trail mm -hmm. Crew that's not using private contractors. And I, we, our organization, as well as other organizations look at this as that, this is an, an opportunity to bring local groups involved in this, instead of having for-profit companies to profitize off of uh, deleterious action that's ongoing on our public lands. This is where we get community involvement, working and assisting agencies to tackle this uh, holistically. So I'm the executive director of the High Sierra Volunteer Trail Crew. We've been around about 22 years. One of our things in our mission statement is stewardship of the forest. So this falls into our mission because uh, all this garbage and especially, you know, all the chemicals ending up in our water table and ending up going into the water are really critical and uh, our volunteers felt like they should do something about it. And a lot of times we'll get local people to volunteer and they come out and they get to see what's going on. And if it's just picking up trash, they participate in picking up the trash and it's really, really a nice thing. So we'll go up and down the Sierras, down to the Los Padres and the Sequoia and the Sierra and the Stan and all the way up north. And we'll just try and get volunteers to come out and help 
all the way along the way. And that's it's a really good thing for the community to get out and see. Because nobody really relates to the way they're trashing the forest. They don't know anything about it. The market in California, um, the legal market, um, if you sell it, there's a number of things that happen. One, you have to be permitted. Uh, you have to pay to get the permits. You oftentimes need to pay consultants to um, help you get permitted. So I've talked to growers who have spent $100,000 in consulting fees to, to meet the, the permit application uh, rules and regulations. Um, your product is then taxed. I think the current tax is 40%. So this is increasing the price quite a bit. And so, um, you know, to stay competitive, you then have to lower your price. Uh, if you're a grower, you have to sell to a wholesaler. So you can't sell it directly from your farm. Um, the wholesaler is going to take a cut. And then the wholesaler has to sell it to a retailer. And the retailer is going to take a cut. So throughout this chain of custody, um, the producers are, are losing their market share. So the alternative <coughs> is... You grow your cannabis and you sell it to somebody who will sell it for you in, in Chicago or Minneapolis or one of the big states where they don't have any legal cannabis. And that's a, a much more profitable way to do it. Although, of course, there are the associated risk <laughs> of being a criminal. <laughs> we don't have as much data on the unpermitted private land grows, but we do know that at least some of them are using rodenticides, some of them are using pesticides, the same ones that we see out here. They're definitely using high amounts of, of fertilizer, and the water diversions are likely just as significant on the, the private yet unpermitted grows. Um, no one really has data on the long-term impacts. So a good example would be Humble County where um, the environmental impact report that the County of Humboldt created uh, estimated that there was 15,000 plus grows in the County of Humboldt alone. Out of those, 2,300 I believe applied for permits and out of those 2,300, 90 to 100 of the 1st of January um, had obtained their permits. So we're still talking about 13,000 grows that at a minimum are unpermitted in just Humble County alone. Trinity County, Mendocino County, that Emerald Triangle, just alone is estimated to be a minimum of 25 to 30,000. Now, if you take that to 50 plus counties in California that are growing, what's estimated is between 85 to 100,000 unpermitted grows. And when you have, I can count probably the amount of teens that are in the state of California. So you're talking about 30, 40 personnel maybe, just completely 100% focused on this, only to address this, permitting um, for the natural resources aspect only within an agency. Even if we'd say, at a, we're, we're still talking years before each and every unpermitted grow is going to be inspected, enforced upon, etc. Are those numbers including the trespass grows or just... No, that's just private land grows. Okay. We're not even talking trespass cultivation. So if we put that together and we say, let's just say 50,000 only. Let's take a very, very conservative estimate and say 50,000 unpermitted grows. We've already done a small pilot project where about 20% of private unpermitted grows are just as egregious and the environmental impacts as a trespass grow. So now let's just even cut that in half and be, again, for the naysayers, be more conservative. Only 10%, 50,000, 10% of 50,000, that's 5,000 grows. That's 5,000, which still would be probably equal to more impacts than a trespass grow occurring in California. And that's, we're saying only 10% of unpermitted grows are equally or more egregious than the actions that are occurring in trespass grows. So mm -hmm. now when people say, oh, private and it's apples and oranges, it may not be. And that's in terms of the pollution? And pollution, the water theft, impacts, all of that. Even the non-trespass grows, what chemicals are they putting on that weed? We know out here that they're putting on some very bad chemicals and people are now smoking it. So we already had a 
the cigarette health crisis, right? And now people are back to smoking something different. We're losing access to our natural resources and the safe use of our land. The problem is only getting worse. I honestly feel like the people who could answer that um, are social scientists and economists. Uh, so I can only guess, but you know, one area of thought is that with the level of the cost associated with doing it legally may be prohibitive for people to do it legally and therefore the black market might be amplified. Um, others think that it might get better over time as the market sort of balances out and um, some folks think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. So.